I am thrilled to be presenting to you today something I prepared on the occasion of Halloween, and it has to do with the undead in the Old Norse world. And the term Draugr in particular, we're going to be exploring the term and its problems, and in particular, two categories of these Norse undead or zombies or vampires, although um, I don't think the modern terminology can apply in this case, but let's see what we can find out. Many thanks to um, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance for this invitation, and um, I hope you will enjoy this presentation. I will start by telling you a little bit about the term itself, because if you look in the Old Norse dictionaries, you're going to find two interesting things, uh, two meanings. So basically, it is a term that occurs in poetry quite a lot, and in poetry, it is used as a metaphor or the so-called kenning in Old Norse for man or warrior. So it doesn't really have this connotation of undead or zombie or anything of the sort. So this is the first meaning. And the second meaning is that of, let's say, spirit or undead or especially a un, uh, dead inhabitant of a burial mound or of a cairn. Um, and this actually makes a lot of sense, and I will explain to you why a little later. So I am going to start with a few general remarks, and then I'm going to discuss two particular types of undead, uh, the Mount Dwellers, the Haugbui, and the Aptergangar, the violent undead, who are a little bit more famous. Mind you, there are also other types and the classification has its limits. I don't think there is a certain way of putting these creatures into their particular category and saying this is for certain an Aptergangar, this is for certain a Mount Dweller and so on and so forth. Although we can differentiate a little bit between them. Then I'm going to discuss a little bit their social function um, regarding their interaction with the uh, living and then point out two other topics related to this one, such as the afterlife and reanimation. All right, so if you go through Old Norse literature, you are going to find some ideas about why some people um, choosing to stay, hang around after their death. For example, they might have an interest in the affairs of the living. And uh, we have here an example I will be dealing with a little later, uh, the hero Gunnar from the saga of Njol. Then we have the idea of certain people wanting to uh, control the household and generally speaking, the territory they used to live in, the district. Um, and as an example, we have in Lax de la Saga, the, the saga of the people of the Salmon Valley, the um, character known as Hrapper, and in many other sagas, uh, in um, Hensathori Saga, for example, we have other and these people generally are up to the ganger in the sense that they can also act very violently, violently in their uh, tendency to control the territory also after their death. Um, with regard to the mound dwellers, um, here you're also going to find uh, a very common pattern, which is that of the interruption by interfering of the living. For example, you have uh, some hero or some king hunting for a treasure and breaking into a burial mound. And in this case, you have the dead, the undead reacting at this. Um, uh, interruption, although at the beginning he might not have had any violent uh, intention. Um, these characters are often particularly strong and troublesome personalities uh, in during their lifetime, and these characteristics are transferred to their undead personality, and this happens very often um, with the Aptergangar, with the, let's call them, revenants. Um, and we have an example here, Thorolf Baigifotr from the Erbigia saga. Again, I will just be discussing him uh, a little later. He is, um, well, perhaps one of the most compelling reverence you can find in Old Norse literature. You can also find the idea of retribution, although I don't really think it's a, it's a pattern in Old Norse literature. So uh, the dead coming back to haunt the living because they they want something from them. Um, we do have examples if we look for them. For example, in Svarte la Saga, we have the hero named uh, Klövi, the character named Klövi, who is uh, killed treacherously, and then he starts haunting the family who brought him his doom. Well, um, when discussing this topic, I think it's a little um, it's it's a little it's it's very important to discuss uh, to also discuss what 
what uh, it meant to be undead and what remained when you became undead. And for this, um, we need to talk a little bit about the idea of the uh, soul in Old Norse, at least to mention the fact that the soul was not conceived um, like it is conceived in Judeo-Christian um, ideology in the sense that you have a body and you have a soul and um, the soul separates from, from the body after, uh, after you die. In Old Norse, literature, religion, culture, you have several elements and these elements are alluded at um, in both the Poetic Edda, the collection of poetry from the 13th century, but um, withholding beliefs which are thought to be much older than that. And you also have references to the um, in the Prose Edda written by Snorri, although um, some things have been corrupted by Christian ideology. But anyway, um, the point is that you have several elements of life. You have, for example, the end, which would mean something like breath of life. This is given by Odin. For example, then you have um, the idea of other um, wit or understanding or sense. It's a very complex word. And then you have the idea of uh, law, which is basically shape. So at least three elements. So the question would be, which ones do the undead keep and which ones do they uh, do they lose? These Draugar seem to have some kind of human appearance, but not the same appearance they used to have during their, uh, during their lifetime. And this is most probably due to the fact that they lose their, their shape. They become these hybrid creatures between life and death uh, in this kind of liminal space in between us, between the land of the living and the land of, um, um, of the dead. They probably also lose their sense of mind and reason because of the fact that although most Draugar also had some some kind of trouble troublesome activity going on during their lifetime they are truly difficult to deal with after uh, after they uh, they die and this is also reflected in their increased uh, strength for example so all kinds of transformations going on after they um, they die so for example uh, about Hrapper we find the information that um, he was as bad as he was in, during his lifetime but his misfortune increased greatly after he was dead and with reference to the reverence, you also find this idea of um, the undead walking a lot more than they used to do in, the, uh, in their lifetime. Um, and I also found a very interesting example from the saga of Egil Einhenda or Osmond Arbersikabana, the saga of Egil the One-Handed and um, Osmond the, um, the Bane of the Berserkers the killer of berserkers. And uh, here um, you have the tale of two brothers and um, Osmond says that he is going to be buried alongside um, Aran after he dies, which he does. And he, then he describes the experience he had in the, in the burial mound. And he describes Aran to be, um, to be rising from the chair and then um, to, um, to have eaten a hawk and a dog, which were also in the, in the mound. Okay, let's say this is kind of normal, if you think about the fact that they, the undead or the dead probably also had um, the need, felt the need to, um, to indulge in something or to uh, satisfy their, uh, their needs after death, um, at least in accordance to this, um, uh, to this type of religion. But then he describes something very strange. He describes um, him skinning uh, the horse, who was also, which was also in the mound, and eating uh, the horse with blood dripping from his jaws. And then he also invited his brother to share, uh, to share the meal with him. And um, then he uh, says that his brother um, started um, attacking him, grabbing his ears and trying to tear them both off. So you can see this, tr this gradual transformation from, um, from a regular person, normal person to, uh, to the undead. All right. And this also has to do with um, uh, the main conceptions about the fate of, uh, of the dead. Um, and in Old Norse religion, it's, um, it's quite interesting and problematic at the same time. So the, the place of the dead after they, um, um, after, you know, they get um, on the other side, because you often find this idea about um, the good coming to Valhalla and the rest uh, going somewhere else. Um, well, that's not really that simple. Simplistic, I would say um, you generally have this idea of going inside a realm of the gods, although I do suspect that's kind of a later concept. And you do have this idea of uh, them continuing to dwell within the earth uh, itself. And here you also have the connection to, uh, to the other world, broadly perceived as 
hell. So my, my suspicion would be that hell was like the generic term for the afterlife, for the, for the other world. Uh, there is actually very little um, evidence to the fact that it was an underworld. This might also have been some kind of Christian um, contamination. And besides, we don't really have um, clear descriptions of this realm being uh, some some place um, under underworld. Uh, we do have a lot of descriptions um, regarding the road to hell. We have, for example, um, Hermot's trip after um, Baldur's um, uh, death. Um, but anyway, um, I, I suspect that this idea of the burial mound can be as a potential gate between worlds. And we do have um, references here. For example, we have the poem of Helgi, uh, Helga Kvida Hundingspana, I will be um, referring to later. And we also have the uh, waking of Angantyr from the uh, saga of Hervor and Heydrek. Um, in which uh, Hervor basically wakes up her uh, father, who is in Valho because he's a he's a famous warrior, he's a famous berserk, uh, but she wakes him up to um, to provide her with um, a sword, the sword, magic sword, Thirfing, who, uh, which is actually um, hers by um, by birth as an uh, as an inheritance. Um, so either way, I think that we have this larger concept of, uh, of an other world. I think we have this concept of the burial mound being the connection to this other world. And I also think we have this um, more particular place known as um, as Valhall. But initially, I think this idea of the underworld of the other world was rather linked to the idea of being just a transported and kept in a burial mound because if you look at the etymology of of the noun hell itself it comes from an old root meaning to cover so to cover your body with uh, with earth to be given back to the earth um, and um, um, in this way you can belong basically belong to both uh, both worlds so you have the burial mound which keeps you in contact with the land of the living but you also you know mind your own business in um, uh, in the other world now let's discuss um, um the term drauker a little uh, more so as i um, um said at the very beginning i think that it is rather a collective uh, term and i think this idea of it being linked to the trunk so something that remains um after death the the body, the physical body with its physical characteristics um, is actually a pretty compelling image if you think of the myth about the creation of uh, people in um, Old Norse mythology, because you have Oscar and Embla, and they are created out of drifting wood found on a beach. You can find references to this myth in different forms in both the Poetic Edda and the uh, Prose Edda, but generally speaking, there are three gods uh, involved either Odin, Lothar and Hönir, or Odin and his um, brothers, the sons of Bur, who endow uh, two trunks, so two pieces of wood, uh, they endow them with different characteristics. So basically, when you become a Draugr, you come back to your initial form, which is that of a piece of wood. Um, if you're going to read some of the Old Norse uh, stories, you're going to find two main categories of such uh, Draugr, of such undead. The first one would be the uh, Haugbui. These are the mound dwellers with mostly activities in their grave. They also interact with the world of the living, but this usually happens um, when, they get, um, uh, when they get robbed or if there is some kind of interference from, from the land of the um, living. Um, the second category, which is a little better known um, because it's a little more interesting, I also have to confess this, I, I prefer the stories about the Abderganger, uh, literally the afterwalkers. These are the ones who actually terrorize the communities outside of the grave and have a lot of activities outside of their, uh, of their grave. Um, besides these two categories, I must add that there are also a lot of other spirits and ghosts which we can't really um, classify as either mount dwellers or aptergangers. So uh, a lot of them are, for example, kind of ethereal appearances or people appearing after death, but just like conveying a message or um, sharing some important news with the members of the family or requesting something, but then they, they just disappear. So their, their interaction with, with the living is uh, very limited. 
Right, and uh, I mentioned before that one of the most famous mount dwellers we can actually find in the poetic edda in this collection of poetry um, it has to do with the hero helgi and his burial mound and with his wife uh, sigrun so after helgi dies we have sigrun who sends one of her serving women uh, to his mound and um, she actually sees helgi riding toward uh, toward the mound with a large following of uh, of men and then here she says, is this an illusion that I am seeing before me? Or is it that Ragnarok has come? Because I see dead men riding, Ridamen Deudir. I see them riding their horses with spears. And then she wonders if these people, if these dead kings actually have been given leave to come home from Valhol. Because technically speaking, they should be with Odin in um, his army of Ein Heriar, just uh, fighting and preparing for the uh, ultimate uh, battle. But they don't do that. They're actually riding outside of this realm. And then Helgi explains that, you know, it's true. You can see us here and we are driving our horses with the spears and it is not an illusion. And neither have we been given permission to come home to um, Valhol. But then the serving woman, uh, the serving woman, goes back home and she says to Sigrun, Helgi's wife, "You know, if you want to see your husband, um, go back to go back from your home, go back to the uh, to the burial mount. Oops, how good luck in communist Helgi, because Helgi has come back and his wounds are bleeding, and the Lord of um, of men." asks you to come to him, to go to him and tend to his uh, to his injuries. And this is actually kind of a tragic story because um, there is this very emotional um, reunion of Sigrun and uh, Helgi, but Helgi ultimately cannot stay um, in, in the land of the living because he does, he does not belong to this world anymore. So he is forced to go back. And um, even if, um, um, if they share a moment of, uh, of intimacy, Sigrun is ultimately um, left alone. So I think this is quite a compelling image from, uh, like I said, an, an older source pointing to the fact that these ideas about the undead and about the Draugr or Mount Dwellers being somehow, somehow suspended between the two worlds um, is not only a literary motif. Uh, I suspect that was actually a recurring idea, or at least um, it does sound like something um, Vikings would have believed. Okay, um, if you look at stories about mound dwellers and uh, burial mounds, you're going to notice the fact that, well, first of all, it's kind of logical in, to, in order to be buried in a grave mound, that would have required a lot of effort and that would have required um, a social status a higher social social status from you so that you can benefit from all those things you carry with you after um, after you die so in order to be buried in a grave mound um, you should have had burial goods to carry on with you and occasionally you also would have had a ship and here uh, you don't only have literary references you also have like archaeological references um probably the most famous example being the uh, Oseberg uh, burial ship but there are a lot more uh, as well and you also had a lot of things sacrificed and taken with you in the afterlife um, animals and even people and um there is the compelling um, story Ib Fatlan uh, relates us with um, uh, regard to what he sees in the land of the uh, Rus, this uh, mix of Nordic and uh, Slavic people during his, um, uh, his journeys. But at any rate, it meant that the deceased must have had some kind of social status that allowed his relatives to bury him uh, or her in such a sophisticated um, way. The point was that you needed goods, you needed um, people and animals and all these things to uh, continue to live. And even if you were dead, that did, that did not mean that um, you had a relationship to the gods limited to Valhol. You could remain in the burial mound and still have a good relationship to the gods. And for example, you have here the um, uh, case of Thorgrim in Gisla Saga, who um, is a priest of, um, of Freyr, and it is related in the saga that um, the gods still um, appreciated the hero and, um, uh, and um, they um, uh, 
maintained good uh, contact or he enjoyed the um, favor of um, uh, of the gods um you also find um, references to this um type of other world or afterlife in a story called Thorstein thought that um, bear monks where you find an instance of a journey uh, connected with a mount there is um, um, a guy here named Thorstein and um, he sees a boy talking to his mother who was actually in a mount and the boy asked her for his um, for her staff because he wanted himself to go to the other world or to the underworld and the staff emerges from the mound and then the boy begins his journey and then Stor Storstein goes and repeats the exact words of the boy and he also gets the same result. He starts riding after the boy and after a long journey he reaches the other world where he actually sees a lot of people uh, celebrating. So you can see that um, not only Valhol is related to this idea of uh, people living, living happily, uh, happily ever after as, um, as a warrior in the afterlife. Um, there are also many instances where um, you don't have Valhol, you just have another world perhaps not specified, but um, um, still it is a place of celebration. And um, mounds, besides that, can also be considered sources, sometimes sources of inspiration for getting uh, knowledge or prophetic, prophetic dreams. And here you have an interesting story, the Thothartho lives uh, Yalaskals, where you have a character, a shepherd, actually, one of the very rare cases where a member of the lower class sits on a burial mound in the hope that they're going to get something, some kind of prophecy or knowledge. And um, this um, shepherd sits on the, the um, uh, on the mound of a very talented and famous poem, a poet, and uh, asks him to, uh, to give him, to share with him the gift of poetic inspiration. And after a great deal of insistence, um, Thorleiver, the poet, um, is actually willing to, uh, to do that. And um, uh, he comes into action, but only after his patient patience have uh, has come to uh, to a limit. So he reacts only after insistence from the part of the living. And this kind of examples um, makes us wonder if we can actually consider the burial mound as some sort of liminal space, like I said before, a space between worlds where the undead can actually uh, move between the two worlds, either the land of the living or the land of, um, of the dead, um, at will or determined by a certain amount um, of, of factors. And um, the mount, in the sense, can be, seen as some, can be seen as some kind of portal. Because if you think about it, the undead, not only in Old Norse mythology, but if you think about, well, basically any mythology, um, they are border creatures. They don't belong to a certain place. And um, this can be seen very clearly in the case of the Haugbuar, because the moment they start manifesting in the land of the living, um, they're actually different than the way there are, they are in the burial mound where they keep on living in one way or another. So when they interact with the living, they are actually in a ghost-like, rather ethereal form, or at least on the, um, on the outside. And I'll go back here to the case of Gunnar Homundarsson, the hero from Brennunior Saga. This uh, is one of the main heroes, and he is killed in an ambush, and um, his corpse sat unavenged in his burial mound. But this doesn't make him... Uh, a vengeful or an unhappy character because he kind of knows that his um, son and his um, um, his other uh, supporters are going to avenge him. So there one there is one day where uh, some people are passing by his grave mound and they say that they have um, they have seen him and um, they have also seen him uh, sing and recite uh, poetry and then his son himself, Hergni, alongside um, um, another character, Skaphedin, go to the mount themselves and um, they say that Han kvad vi so svoat at pomoti heira gerla thoat ther vari fir. So basically um, Gunnar was there and um, uh, saying stuff out loud and you could hear him pretty clearly, although the distance was uh, considerable. 
Gunnar is a very happy character, like I said before, um, and uh, he is reciting verses outside his mound, and um, that doesn't impair the uh, belief that he is somewhere in Valhall as well in, um, uh, in any way. And um, this appearance of his is almost as if it were in a dream, and we we also have a term for this, for this dream-like creature, for, for this ghost-like creature appearing to uh, to characters. But it's not really in a dream because they they actually see him. It's just dreamlike, uh, fearir booth. That's another term you will find um, in um, in regard to ghosts or spirits in um, on this account. Um, in another story, we have a character called Aknar in Thorsvedniga saga who appears to uh, to Thori to prevent his men from robbing his mound. And he tells him very clearly that he should not break into his mound. And he actually offers some gifts in return for this um, respect, if they pay this respect to him. He offers a pair of magic gloves, a knife, a belt, and some gold and silver. So you can see that these ghosts actually interact with, um, with the living. Although they um, appear as visions or as dreams, they do have some physical effects. They can also offer some swords in other stories. But um, initially, they don't really act violently as much as they appear to be uh, to be offended. Their app apparition is a rather ethereal way in the realm of the living and this can also be due to the fact that you know it's not really their place. They don't belong there. They belong to their grave, to their grave, uh, to their grave mount. And this has to do with the idea of hybridization after death. Um, if you're a mount dweller, so you have this um, more um, uh, corporeal or scary apparition if you are in the grave, and then you have this more uh, ghost-like apparition if you are outside of the grave. You have the uncertainty of um, of shape. Um, the sources don't describe them, like I said, as particularly horrific when they are um, um, in interaction with the living. On, on the contrary, sometimes they are well-dressed, they are imposing, they are even handsome. Um, and um, perhaps the only scary thing is yeah, you know that they make contact to to the living, and that's kind of like a uh, like an unexpected um, thing. The monstrous features are inside the mound, and uh, they are a result of their suspension between uh, between the worlds. Now, breaking into a burial mount and defeating such a revenant, such a draugr, brought you a great deal of honor and riches. Um, but in order to perform that, because many of these, I think most of these mount dwellers were actually very respectable and honorable people when they were alive, you also had to be of a high uh, status. And um, some other conditions would also um, have needed to be uh, fulfilled. For example, you should have should have acknowledged the fact that you are um, that it is not your treasure that you are appropriating the treasure of some other being, and it was also recommendable that you shared that treasure with. Uh, with other people, so the grave goods would not necessarily consider the private property of those who just who just burst into the uh, burial mount and started wrestling with the uh, with the hawk buoy. And you find a lot of examples um, of this in um, uh, in literature. So. Um, Regarding this aspect of somebody needed to um, needing a, a status, a high status, in order to uh, to fight the Draugr, you have a reference in um, one of the many references you have. You have in Hromundar Saga Krepsonar, you have uh, the hero Hromund who is advised to stop robbing the people that he meets, but just uh, go and rob the uh, the Draugr, just go and uh, enter the burial mount of somebody who is a worthy uh, opponent, and uh, he then also needs to distribute what he achieve, achieves. Um, in the more famous saga of Grechtir, the uh, hero Grechtir is advised in his um, encounter with, um, uh, with the Draugr named Kor. I will come back to him later. He is um, advised when he breaks into Kor's mound that it is a risky business what he's doing and he is warned that he should just leave the treasure there. 
Um, his son is actually the one telling him this because um, he didn't really like the idea of having a foreigner kill the Draugr of his father and taking away the uh, grave goods. And the wisest choice would be in the sense for Gretir to just go and um, um, limit himself to the idea of having gained honor instead of grave goods and uh, treasures, which was actually the best treasure you could get if you killed uh, a Draugr, you would have become more famous and you would have become more honorable. Um, so if you break broke into a grave mount and you wanted to plunder it, um, you would have seen that initially the Draugr, the Haugbui, wouldn't have been a very violent character. So at the beginning, at least, he would have acted in a pretty tolerant way. Um, and um, although they, these characters would have been represented with the superhuman strength and the need to destroy and so on and so forth, at least at the beginning they were passive. And you have examples, for ex um, in um, the saga of Romund, I mentioned before. You have um, the king. You have King Thrain, who is also um, who also has his grave mound broken into, and despite being uh, quite extensively insulted. He is even called a dog, um, which was the, uh, it was this, the kind of insult that would have provoked a feud lasting for generations. He doesn't really react to that. Um, he waits, but in the end, he does react after, um, you know, Hromund uh, being very persistent in his, um, in his insult um, and um, uh, provoking a reaction from, um, uh, from Throin. Mm, right. Um, you're going to find a lot of patterns, um, which are more like literary conventions. If um, if you look throughout the stories, you're going to find descriptions of the uh, mound dweller, of the Haugbui, uh, such as him sitting, being bloated, or black or blue or stinky. Um, and you are also going to um, find him with a lot of fanciful adornments, decoration, clothes, and so on and so forth. Um, a very interesting idea is the fact that the hero breaking into the mound has to fight him without weapons, so only wrestling. This might point out to the uh, idea of being impervious to weapons. And um, there is this great fight going on where the whole mound is being uh, trashed and a lot of obstacles such as um, the great stench not only coming from, from the dead himself, but generally speaking, such a great stench that people would actually fall dead because of it. Um, or you can find also all kinds of natural phenomena uh, going on, like a storm and um, um, also the motif of the mound closing itself at night, making it very difficult for the uh, hero to intrude. And I'm going to tell you about two very interesting stories, because although we have all these patterns that we find in uh, Old Norse literature, um, we should take each case separately because um, the the meanings or the motifs are arranged differently. And um, um, sometimes you can also find very clear differences uh, between the more pagan versions of the sagas and the more Christian version, versions of the sagas. So, for example, you have in Harvard Saga a um, very compelling mound breaking episode taking place in um, Gotland during the Yule celebrations. Um, Hroar makes a vow to break into Soti's mound, and because he makes this vow during the Yule celebrations. He has to keep it. That is absolutely um, com um, compulsory. There is no way of not doing it. And um, then um, Herder makes a vow to go with him and uh, not to leave the uh, expedition. So they have a party uh, of 12 men. And uh, in the way, they meet a stranger named Bjorn, who offers his help in case um, they need it. And this character later proves to be Odin himself. So these people go to the grave mount and dig it until they reach the burial chamber. But then during the night, like I said before, it closes itself. And this happens two nights in a row. So Herder goes back and asks for Odin's help. And in this um, uh, situation, he gets a sword and is told to put it in the opening in the mount during the night so that it would prevent the mount from closing itself. And this trick actually works because finally, um, in the morning, they're able to enter the chamber. And it stinks so much that many of the men actually die from 
uh, from the smell. And in the fifth day, they can actually get into the burial chamber, heard the descents using a rope, which is being held by his friend Geir. And after exploring the burial chamber, he cannot find traces of any treasure or haugbui. So he asks Geir to come and bring with him uh, fire. Then they explore the mount further and they find a door um, when they break it uh, an earthquake takes place and the lights go out and then a horrible smell arises and there is a slight shining there which allows them to see a boat burial and they realize that the light was coming from the whole treasure that was in it so there they find this guy Soti sitting on the prow with a very dreadful scary look and he remains seated until he is insulted he's insulted in a poem actually um and um, Herder just states that he's going to take his uh, treasure. And at this point, uh, the Draugr starts reacting. They wrestle and Herder is actually um, losing. So he asks Geir to light the candle. And when he does that, Soti loses um, his strength and he falls on the ground. And uh, they take advantage of this to ransack the place. Um, so Herder takes, for example, Soti's arm ring and um, Soti, on the other hand, lays a curse on it. In response, they decide to torture him using light and um, Soti doesn't really like that at all. So he sinks in the ground and escapes. They empty the place and uh, take Soti's sword and helmet. And when they want to leave the mount, they realize that their friends left the place. And uh, later it is clear that they did that because they got extremely scared um, during the earthquake. So they have to pull themselves out of, uh, out of the um, grave. And this has a good ending for, um, uh, for Herder who earns great honor and Sotis uh, things. So his helmet, his sword and his arm ring. So I think this is a very compelling example uh, in order for you to see the, these um, uh, patterns, these motifs I mentioned uh, earlier about um, how the drug reacts, uh, what, what the heroes do uh, according to the situation and so on and so forth. And there is a very similar story, an extremely sim similar story, um, Bordas Naga's Knifelessness, where you also have um, this idea of um, somebody making a vow during Yule, during Christmas, and then having to uh, go rob a burial mount. And this time we have um, a guest who is a character refusing to be converted, but he is spending the winter with um, uh, the baptized king Olaf Tryggvason. And on the evening, the king and his men are um, in the best of their mood until a stinky but fully armed man enters the hall and he offers his sword, helmet, arm ring and neckband to the one who will dare take them from him. And uh, he departs, leaving his stench behind him. And due to his this stench, the king's men are almost um, dead. And then Guest discovers that this man was an ancient king of Heluland. And then Oliver asks him to go and solve this, um, claim the treasure and um, um, get rid of Ragnar in uh, his burial mound. And uh, the king gives him everything he needs for the expedition. Uh, they receive, he and his people um, receive iron shoes, two magicians, a priest, a sword, a piece of cloth and a candle. Now, initially, Guest uh, refuses to take the priest to his expedition, but the priest um, will turn out to be the most useful character um, on the quest. Um, the king persuades him to take him and the men form an expedition of about, um, I think there were 20, 22 or 23 people. There is also a one-eyed man. Odin, as you might suspect, uh, who wants to join the expedition and he starts preaching something about the old faith and the priest gets sick of him and uh, hits him with a crucifix. So in the story, Odin uh, doesn't really play an important part. The voyage continues without him. And um, although it is clear that there is a tendency from the, on, on the side of the author to, to, to um, um, distance himself from the pagan elements, there is still a great amount of supernatural elements in the story. Um, so um, both magicians, for example, are swallowed by the earth and then they confront an aggressive bull that cannot be hurt by weapons. Um, in this case, the priest appears and uh, again, hits it with the crucifix, kills the beast. And um, um, then they walk on the lava fields. Um, again, the priest 
proves himself to be the best in the story because he walks on the lava field without protection. And then they reach Rakra's mound and dig a hole in it. The next morning, they realize that the mound has closed during the night. Uh, this happens a few days in a row. And um, um, then using his water and the crucifix, the priests, the priest actually manages to uh, open the mound and then they encounter all kinds of spirits and uh, uh, temptations. Mm, um, they continue, nevertheless, the expedition and uh, a guest uh, goes into the mound again using a rope, which is being held by uh, his men and the priest. He is also armed with the sword that the king gave him. Um, he is able to see a ship burial with um, 500 men in it. They are about to attack a guest, but when the candlelight reaches them, they become almost paralyzed and he gets the chance to decapitate them. He then reaches a tunnel, and at the end of this tunnel, he sees Raknar, uh, very dreadful to see, but again, very well dressed and with a treasure at his feet. They greet each other, and um, Guest starts taking Raknar's possessions. But when he um, wants to take his sword, Raknar begins to fight, and the candle is now almost completely consumed. Um, in this case, Guest um, appears to be almost defeated. However, he says that if, um, um, if the new god is going to help him, he is going to get uh, baptized converted to King Olaf's new faith, which is um, um, exactly what happens um, because a great light comes about that paralyzes Laknar and allows uh, Guest to behead him. Then um, the priest uh, splashes water on uh, the men who in the meantime get insane and they recover their minds and uh, when they are about to leave there is this huge earthquake and the whole island sinks and um, everyone is about to die but then the priest again takes his crucifix and water and um, um, make, does some tricks and um, the sea opens and they can walk to the continent. So. I think this is a pretty compelling image um, in this conversion story because you can see that um, there are a lot of elements these stories have uh, have in common, but then again, there are also a lot of elements which um, dif are different because in the second story, the supernatural and the supernatural help is used as a means of um, uh, basically showing that Christianity was uh, the religion, the best religion to be um, followed if um, you were to go on such uh, a quest, uh, for example. Uh, but then again, I think it's also important to um, dwell on the, uh, on the elements which are commonplace because you're also going to find them in, um, um, in other uh, stories. So the idea of getting supernatural help and um, um, the idea of magic objects, uh, the sacred obligation uh, in Yule time, um, the um, idea of a quest itself, um, the importance of light and so on and so forth. And of course, this image of the Haukbui of being this character who is initially passive only to react violently when he gets upset when people try to rob him of a thing or, uh, of, or another. So as a preliminary conclusion to our mound dwellers, uh, just remember the fact that they are initially um, spirits who try to protect their whereabouts, try to protect their goods. They share the ability to communicate. They can also communicate in very elaborate verse in poetry. And usually you can identify, identify them as higher ranking people who are dealt with by another higher ranking uh, character, a hero. Uh, 